What's up everybody, how's it going? It's Berk aka Danzigweight here and welcome to part 3 of this challenge to complete Final Fantasy X using auto battle only or when that's not available basically doing an attack only run. So from the first two parts we've already made a ton of progress and I have to say this challenge has been really fun so far. It's actually more interesting than I ever imagined it would be and it's got me playing the game in a very very different way to how I usually play. So it's been a really good time. And honestly, as of this point onwards, in terms of the recording side of things, I started to get really invested and motivated to try and see how far I could take this challenge. So I've been doing a lot of recording and a lot of playing to see how far I can get. So I'm not going to give too many spoilers at this point. I've got this far, I've done this, I've done that. We're going to be taking things in real time as I do this voiceover. And you guys should hopefully get to see how I've been progressing and what the roadblocks have been and how I've managed to overcome them. So at this point, we have passed Wendigo and we've started to really get to much more serious parts of the game in terms of what kind of battles we're going to expect. So I was looking forward to seeing what was in store. But before that, we had a little bit of storyline stuff to do. And thankfully, once again, the cutscene skipper, uh, times for speed, all of those kind of things really kind of helped to move things along pretty quickly. So let's get on to the next part of the actual gameplay. So I will show a little bit of like menu usage and like a few little sphere grid adjustments I made, any kind of equipment that I was using. But in general, I didn't dwell too long on this section and I just continued on. Now, actually, what I said I was going to do at the end of the last video was to basically farm Wendigo for SOS Haste because it is a rare drop from Wendigo and it's something that is very, very difficult to get and you won't be able to get it until much later in the game. And so I figured it would be a good idea to make sure I farm this guy, got at least one SOS Haste drop for a relevant character and then progressed on. But as I said before, I got a bit too excited with this challenge. Like at this point, I was really raring to go and see how far I could take the challenge. And so I completely forgot to do this and I just steamrolled on towards Beacon L. And so um, SOS Haste is not going to be obtained here, but if you're ever trying this yourself or some other variation of this challenge, I would definitely take the time to get SOS Haste from Wendigo because there's no doubt it could be useful in certain situations. But for me at least, and for this run, it's going to be a while still before I end up getting SOS Haste. So that's something that I should kind of mention straight off the bat because it's something I said I would do, but then I completely forgot. And I think by the time I realized I'd been playing for about an hour and I was like, I'm not going to go back and do all of this again for the SOS Haste because I was feeling fairly confident at this stage that I could make some more progress and see how far I could go. So the events at the bottom of the lake transpire and we get transported to Beacon L. Now, as a result of the cutscene skipping and stuff, uh, you have some weird things happening where the hymn heard at the bottom of the lake continues in Beacon L, which is really kind of fascinating. <laughs> Obviously, like a, a glitch that kind of occurs as a result of the cutscene skip but it was kind of surreal to kind of hear it continue here. But yeah, definitely made sure I picked up the remedies. Uh, remedies are quite hard to come by at this stage of the game. Um, they're not really dropped by much at all at this stage, and chests are pretty much your best bet, and gifts from NPCs and that kind of thing. And I did think that auto med is the kind of thing that could be useful in this challenge, so whenever I had a chance to pick up remedies, I definitely tried to. And auto med is something that you'll see kick in later on in the playthrough. But for now, we have the first zoo that we have to face. And you can already see, I mean, the damage that Tidus is doing is pretty huge. And especially when he lands a critical like that, he's just doing huge, huge damage. And that's the main reason why I was kind of confident at this stage, because I did have to put in a lot of work to be able to defeat Anima uh, using attack only. And as a result, I was like, the, the fiends that I'm going to face here, even the zoo, they're not going to be that much of a threat. But we'll just have to see as, uh, as we make progress here. But this was basically the first time ever that Tidus took out the zoo before Lulu even showed up. It was pretty hilarious. But that's what I mean. It's just a different kind of playthrough. It's not something I really experienced before. So, yeah, Tidus picked up another bright shield for his trouble. Um, it had another... I already had one, so it wasn't that important. But what I needed to do was make sure Waka was involved in the team as soon as possible and basically put together my kind of uh, three musketeers once again with Waka, Tidus, and Kimari to have them kind of carry me through uh, Beacon L. So despite that, I still made sure I gave like the other characters like Lulu um, any important stuff that I had. But I think as a result of the cutscene skip, Waka showed up automatically here. So I would have had to take maybe 10, 15 steps to get to him, but um, he showed up pretty immediately here. 
So I kept him with the TKO, of course, it's still very useful at this stage. Uh, Tylus is dealing massive damage, so his statuses aren't as important at this stage, he's just taking things out. And he's got the slow touch anyway for things like Sandworm and the Zoo. So Waka is starting to lag behind a bit here as a result of not being on the same path as Tidus and Kimari. So that is something that continued for quite some time. Waka was uh, behind in terms of his damage output. But at this stage there, was, there wasn't really anything I could do so I just kept on going and pushed on. Unfortunately, as a result of this challenge, for example, Albed potions are something that you cannot use. You can't use them outside of battle, so you can't use them for like a quick heal. And in battle, because they get rid of poison as well, they can be very, very effective. Healing the entire party for a thousand, two thousand if you have alchemy, and remove poison. But unfortunately, it's not something we get to use at all in this challenge, which is a bit of a shame. But again, that's kind of the whole point and what makes these challenges interesting and potentially very difficult. So out of instinct, I still pick up all of the chests and all the potions and stuff anyway, but it wasn't something I could use in the challenge. So of course, immediately I ran towards Kimari to make sure I got him back in the squad. And I got a little bit lucky with a low encounter rate. I was able to run straight to him and just add him to the party. So as soon as that happened, I made sure I just set things up again. Um, I'm keeping Auron in reserve still for now. Um, if there's a mandatory battle that he has to be involved in, I can always spend some time kind of um, raising his stats again. And whenever I'm drop farming for something, he's a character that I can swap in as like a third character among two stronger ones so that I can get him some sphere levels pretty quickly. So in general, it should be okay. But for Kimari, I made sure I put him back in. I gave him his poison touch because it can help against the sandworm and the zoo as well. And it was on to the regular encounters. Tidus, I mean, first hit, critical again. 7,500 damage. It was just completely obscene. Um, in general, like these guys just couldn't really hang with us. They were just too weak. The bird was difficult to hit for some of them, but overall their damage output, it just wasn't sufficient. And the ones that were actually dangerous, like the wyvern type in the middle, he was pretty easy to take out. So I never really had any like specific struggles against any of the smaller ones especially. So Beaconel in that sense, as predicted, it actually ended up going pretty easily. So here's a fully fledged zoo encounter, just so you can see how it plays out. Um, I decided to start speeding things up at this point because um, you know, I wanted to get on with things and I was pretty confident that I didn't need to show too much here. The zoo does do a lot of damage if it manages to hit you, but as you can see the character's agility is pretty decent at this stage too and we're doing big damage, so even the zoo in general is not that big of a deal. Now, what is a little bit of a deal is the fact that, of course, for the first time, like a, for a legit section of the story, we don't have Yuna in the party. So the only thing I was wondering here was, am I going to struggle with having to heal uh, without Yuna? Because I have been using her cure ability in the menu to keep these guys healed up. Now, thankfully, Beaconel has a, a pretty decent number of save spheres scattered among them, so you're never too far away from one. And I thought, when I'm not close to one, I'm just going to have to use high potions to heal. And we'll see how far we can go by doing that. So that was the plan. And thankfully, it wasn't too bad. Uh, we managed to survive. And there are enemies here that give you high potions as well. Because the game kind of knows. Obviously, it's, it's a smartly designed game. It knows that Yuna's not around. It knows that you're going to need a little bit more healing. So not only does it introduce the owl bed potions here, but it makes sure that you get some high potions available too. So that you can heal uh, in battle and outside of it. But in general, that was a deal. I mean, the, in terms of like the actual enemy encounters, there wasn't that much to think about. Uh, the mechs weren't a problem either. Titus was just completely ripping through those guys. Uh, no trouble at all. And again, they can't really damage you that much anyway. So all in all, for the smaller encounters, like the mechs, um, like the bird, the wolf, all of those guys, there were absolutely no problem. Uh, the zoo, now and then, it could do pretty big damage. And it can definitely KO some characters, depending on which ones it targets and whether it actually hits. But in general, it wasn't really anything to be too worried about. The only enemy here that's really like significant and that's worth spending any length of time talking about is actually the Sandworm. Because the Sandworm is a huge enemy, has an absolutely massive HP pool for this part of the game. And it's also a very important enemy for a challenge like this. So let's break it down here. The boys are doing enough damage to get this done. So in terms of like actually surviving the battle, it's not a problem at all. Uh, they're more than powerful enough. And Kimari's Poison Touch can also help a little bit too, because it takes 10% of his HP every time it succumbs to poison. So that's a nice little boost, considering just how much HP this beast has. 
But one of the main reasons this guy is important is because it is the earliest point in the game and one of the rarest enemies in the game that actually drops auto potion. So I've said it right from the start, this is the kind of challenge where healing in battle is very, very difficult unless you have some specific things to help you do that. And of course, the most obvious one is auto potion. So already when I was in B Canal, I knew that I would have to spend some time here to get myself some auto potion because moving forward, there were going to be very few opportunities. And I was pretty certain there's going to be a time when I need to get some auto potion working. Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to get through. So for me in B Canal, one of the, the primary things to make sure I did before leaving was to make sure I drop farmed for an auto potion for one of my important characters. And so that was going to take a long time, but I knew it was going to be a nice way to try and pick up some other armors and items along the way to level up my characters and to bring along a few stragglers as well. So people like uh, Auron as well. I could use him as well in these battles and level him up a little bit. So I could kill multiple birds with one stone. And hopefully by the end of it, I would be able to get myself an auto potion armor. If you're curious, the probabilities of receiving one, well, the probability of getting a drop at all is 50%. Then, of course, 50% that it's an armor, 50% that it's a weapon. So you're already down to 25% chance that it's a armor that's been dropped. And then from there, there's a 1 in 7 chance that you get an auto potion. So you're looking at roughly around a 3 to 4% chance of it being an auto potion armor dropped from any given sandworm encounter. So you can already tell that this is going to take quite a while to do, and it definitely did. It was another grindy section, but I knew for a fact that this is just not something that you can give up very easily, because the only other alternative is to customize auto potion, and customizing auto potion requires stamina tablets, which are extremely difficult to get. They're impossible to get at the moment, but even moving forward, like deep into the game, stamina tablets are going to be very hard to get in this challenge until you're very deep in the game. So it's something that's worth considering too. And that's why I was like, I'm definitely not leaving until I get an auto potion. Ideally, I would have got multiple auto potions. Like literally, if I could get one for Tidus, Kimari, Waka, and Auron maybe even, I would have done it. But honestly, it was taking really long by the end of the farming sesh. And so I got one and I was thinking, you know what, I think this is enough. And I'll try my luck and see if I can make do with just one auto potion. But again, ideally, I would I would try to get multiple auto potions before leaving Beaconel if you're attempting a challenge like this. So that was one of the main aspects of Beaconel, the sandworm and the auto potion armor that it can drop. Of course, again, knowledgeable players will know that one of the main things you can get in Beaconel as well are teleport spheres. I mentioned them very, very early in the game as a way to completely break the game put everybody onto different grids and to get them the kind of stats and abilities that they wouldn't normally get very early in the game. But to do that, you have to invest a lot of time into Blitzball. It's a very niche way to break the game that almost no one uses unless it's a very specific challenge or you're a very specific type of player. So that's why I never really used it and I wanted to try my best to get them a little bit more legitimately than that and not waste hours trying to do Blitzball leagues in order to get them. And so the first place where you can legitimately get them and use them on the sphere grid or use them to make an evading counter weapon which is going to be very important is beacon l so once you get to the section with those kind of um quicksand whirlpool thingies that have the sandra goras in them that is going to be your opportunity to pick up the teleport spheres so the battle itself is actually kind of interesting so let's have a look at the sandra gora battle and see how that went down I've definitely had plenty of experience with Sandragora before and I knew that the main threat is going to be the confusion that it can cause. Now I didn't have good confusion protection all round for everybody so I knew that there was going to be a little bit of risk and a little bit of RNG with this kind of stuff. So I tried to set up things as best as I could because this could be a dangerous kind of encounter. When you have a glass cannon kind of party like these guys, uh, if they get confused they are extremely dangerous so you have to try your best to avoid confusion where possible. And so thankfully, uh, we had Kimari with a Confuse Ward and Waka had one too. But Tidus was the strongest character and he also didn't have any confusion protection. So I had to be a bit careful with him because that was going to be uh, potentially dangerous if he gets confused on the first turn. So the battle began and as you can see, this guy has tough armor. So if you don't have piercing, you end up doing very little damage here, which is pretty important because they have 12,000 HP. So the boys are trying their best here, but as you can see, it's not going so well. 
Waka got confused despite his confused ward because uh, the percentage is not strong enough to kind of make him immune to it. Then I got a second confusion and Kimari was the only one left in the race. <laughs> As you can see, things just get out of control very quickly here. But I managed to hang on because Waka's weak enough that when he hit himself, he knocked out the confusion. And then Tynus got hit with another seed burst and that one ended up knocking out the confusion that he already had. So it was a bit messy and you could tell that things could get dangerous with the Sandragora. But thankfully, uh, RNG was on my side. I quickly realized that the Snakehead doesn't have piercing. Uh, I was so used to kind of the poison touch and just keeping it equipped as a no-brainer that when I faced Sandragora, I was like, oh shit, wait, this guy doesn't have piercing. And so that limited my damage output a lot. So that's why moving forward, I was thinking, you know what? I'm doing enough damage anyway. Uh, poison, yeah, it's helpful, but it's not like a game changer. And I figured I might as well just keep Kimari with a piercing weapon so I could take those Sandragoras out a little bit more easily. So, yeah, the Cactars here, they're also not a problem. They're not going to get enough attacks in to kill your entire party. Uh, they might fire off a 10,000 Needles, which of course is going to kill you. But in general, they, they weren't too much of a threat. And as a bonus, of course, they drop initiative weapons, which could be useful if you want to keep those equipped for a party member as well. So the final thing to talk about with Beaconel uh, here, in terms of like this Grand Expanse kind of section, is to do with the Teleport Spheres. So one of the, the Whirlpool things, the Quicksand areas, has the Teleport Spheres in them. And of course, you have to defeat a Sandragora to be able to get it. So, second encounter here, I gave Tidus a Fire Strike, and I gave Kimari something with Fire on it as well, and Piercing. And so, that combination of Fire, which is weak to, plus the Piercing as well, really gave us a lot more firepower here. No pun intended. And so, even though it confused us, we managed to take out the Sandragora without too much issue. And, as a result, we got two Teleport Spheres. Now, here I had a lot of like potential ideas and it's a pretty big decision how you use these ultimately i decided to just say you know what if it ain't broke don't fix it i'm not at a point where i'm really struggling for anything at this stage because you could choose to for example move like waka onto tida slash kimari section of the grid to get him kind of progressing even further that's an option you can use a different character if, if for whatever reason there's another character that you think is like intrinsically better. So you like the fact that Riku has high, I don't know, base agility and you just want to move her straight away to a different part of the grid to get her stronger quicker. That's also possible. Um, or you can of course use it for evade encounter. Now ideally you want evade encounter to be on like your kind of optimal best possible weapon. And as a result you're going to want it on a weapon that has a lot of different slots. And at this stage of the game, having a weapon with a lot of different slots is not going to be very common at all. So it was a kind of tough decision to, to see how I would use these uh, teleport spheres uh, once I received them. But the amount of options they give you and the fact that, of course, you've got evade encounter is a massive deal. So picking up those teleport spheres was definitely important and I would end up using them fairly soon. Of course, I decided if there's any character that should get it right now, it should be Tidus. He's going to be present in the highest number of battles. I had something that had three free slots on it, so I thought, you know what? Strength plus three is a bit shit. But if I add Evade Encounter and then add Piercing to it, that should already make it a pretty formidable weapon. So it wasn't ideal. I would have loved something that had a better full slot or just an empty one, of course. But at this stage, beggars can't be choosers, so I decided to just keep it simple and give him the Evade Encounter. Give him the piercing as well because especially in an attack only challenge it's just too important and i did find that this is one of the biggest differences between like a, a standard run and a run like this one like normally piercing is just not something i really consider customizing onto a weapon but for this challenge it's especially if it's not kimari or Oren that get it as standard for almost all of their weapons it was definitely something that was worth doing and adding to the weapon and so the final thing to do in Beacon Ale before heading to home specifically was to try and farm the sandworms for that auto potion armor. I hung out mostly in this section with the ruins here. This is where you get basically most of the difficult enemies appearing. And the encounter rate for the sandworm is the highest. And as a result, we did spend a lot of time here. We got a lot of levels because we obviously spent time here. And we defeated the highest AP giving enemies in the region as well. So in that sense, it was a fruitful uh, session. But in terms of like the drop RNG, I don't think it was that impressive. I fought against it a lot, and I only managed to get one auto potion, which was a little bit frustrating. 
And so after a long old grind and fighting countless sandworms, I finally got the Shaman Arm Guard for Waka. And you can tell from the amount of gil that I have here. I mean, this has all been legit farming at this point. And I had almost 300,000 gil by the time I got this uh, particular thing. If it was only one free slot, I think I would have kept going. But the fact that he had at least two, it was okay. In an ideal world, you want to farm an auto potion with four free slots. But like I say, it took me a long enough time just to get this one. And my general kind of approach to the challenge has been to try and not overstay. And not try to over farm, try to over level. Just get what I need and then move on. And so after this, I, I hung out for a little bit longer. Because it hadn't been like a, a, an insane amount of time. You can still see I'm under 9 hours for my total time played here. So in that sense, it's just been really, really quick progress. And I have been trying my best to kind of maintain that momentum and that flow and not just take like a 5 hour time out to just do something completely crazy if it's not necessary for me to make progress. So that's the general philosophy and that's what's continued in this run. And so once I had this for Waka, it really was time to move on and gain access to home where I was again pretty confident that the enemies there shouldn't be too difficult and I should be able to take them out with relative ease. So there was one more Sandragora standing in my way, but honestly, despite the confusion, the piercing plus the fire weaponry that I had was just too much for it. And again, Tylus was the only one that was so strong that he could take out his allies and himself with one hit. So in that sense, it made things a little bit safer as well. And before I knew it, it was time for I'm annoying, ha ha. In general, with home, you're going to be seeing in the background footage what I got up to anyway. Uh, nothing here was particularly difficult. The Chimeras I thought might pose a challenge because they have 9,000 HP each. But honestly, again, like my, my characters, they're just they're too strong for it. And Waka's TKO works against them as well. So in that sense, it was definitely an easy area to make progress through. And for that reason, I kind of hung around. I made sure I did uh, the Albed puzzles and all of that kind of stuff just to pick up a few little extra things. So for example, with one of them, you can basically choose what comes out of the chest. For that one, I chose an elixir. You never know when it could come in handy. And so just general little things like that, um, I made sure I did. But it wasn't too eventful in home. I mean, story drama aside, uh, we're skipping the cutscenes anyway. But in terms of the battles that we were facing, there was nothing particularly problematic about home. Normally, this would have been a place where I would have been farming for like Arctic winds and that kind of thing from the Chimeras, like in a normal run, or like a normal challenge run. But here, like the drops that they provide, they're nothing particularly interesting either. So there wasn't any need to drop farm anything in this particular situation either. So with all of that said, home really didn't last that long. Maybe about 10-15 minutes, including doing all of the, the Albed puzzles and making sure I got everything. So I did all of that stuff, uh, did all of the puzzles, defeated the Chimeras, the Jewel Horns, the Evil Eyes, the Bombs. Uh, all of those guys, there were no problem at all. One thing I will say about home, though, is to try and make sure that you do get all of the, the Albed primers available here. Um, I've not tried to make sure I get every single one as I've gone along so far, but anything that I know to be missable, like the ones in home, it's definitely worth getting those because, of course, if you have all of the primers, you can get 99 underdog secrets, which you never know. I mean, with the underdog secrets, you can use 30 of them to customize double overdrive. Now, you might be thinking you're not even using your overdrives in this challenge. What's the point? But you never know. I mean, we might get far enough that we need to do some stat maxing someday. And to be able to do that with the restrictions that we have, we might need to make our own kind of stat farming weapon. And so having some like double overdrive and then trying to customize overdrive to AP points, etc. You never know. It might come in handy. So it's, it's worth thinking far ahead sometimes because you just never know when things could become useful. So I definitely wouldn't miss out on those um, on those primers if I were you. Also, as a result of what you're doing in home, you can pick up a friend sphere. Now again, that's smart because if you want to, depending on what your situation is, you can move someone onto Tidus's grid or Waka's grid or something like that to give them more options moving forward as well. So the friend sphere was also a nice pickup while I was in home. But with all of that done, I was ready to move on to get back onto the airship and face the red carpet that has teeth. Okay, my friends, it's time to take on Evray. This one I was a bit worried about because we can't maneuver the airship at all. And that means we're going to be facing the poison breath multiple times in this battle. So, of course, the first thing on my, on my mind was to give everyone poison protection. That was like the, the first kind of major thing to, to think about. 
Now, for Waka, I wasn't sure what to do. I don't think he had poison protection specifically. Uh, I could give him some, but I was curious to see if some of my SOS regen or auto potion was actually a better solution. Like, let him get poisoned, but then he can just heal himself with the auto potion. So that was something I was thinking about and that I wanted to test on a run. Now, with Evray as well, another danger is that once you get it below a certain threshold of HP, it ends up using haste. And so Waka and Kimari especially, they don't have like incredible agility. So I thought maybe when it has haste plus the poison breath and all that kind of stuff, it might be extremely difficult to defeat it once it gets down to the haste phase. So I wasn't like confident about this one. It was like anything can happen. So I, I kind of came into it trying to prepare as best I could. Alongside poison, of course, it has stone gaze, which is a big, big problem. So we've got poison and we have petrification. Now at this stage, it's impossible to have poison proof and it's impossible to customize stone proof onto anything. There are no enemies that drop stone proof at this point either. So this means that regardless of what you have, you are going to have to rely on some RNG to help you with this particular situation. So it's one of these like kind of, no pun intended, but you've got to pick your poison. Do you want to potentially deal with poison or do you want to risk like a petrification? If you are, which characters are going to have petrification resistance, which ones are going to have poison resistance. It's difficult to kind of have it all. So I set up as best I could and I decided to keep Waka with an auto potion. I customized Stone Ward and Poison Ward for Tidus and I did the same for Kimari so that those guys could at least protect themselves against the worst of it. But in terms of Waka, he didn't have any poison protection or petrification protection and so I wanted to just see how that would go and see if I could kind of get away with him avoiding petrification and also kind of out healing any poison issues that he was going to run into. Also made sure to restock my um, items so that if I need to customize in the view Purifico I had the items to work with for Yuna for example. It's always worth doing that. So yeah I did a final check but yeah poison and petrification protection for Titus and Kimari and auto potion for Waka. So with that I decided to give it my first attempt and see what I could do against the truly mighty Everett. Auto battle is disabled unfortunately in this one so it turns into an attack only challenge. But of course still no ability to use the trigger command or anything like that. You just have to attack and hope for the best. So that's exactly what I did. I do have evade encounter now though which is definitely a, a nice boost. So I got going with Tylus and straight away his 4000 damage was definitely impressive. And Waka coming in with the 3,200 critical as well, I was already feeling pretty good about myself. Then the Stone Gaze came, and because it has a 100% affliction rate, if you have Stone Ward, that still means there's a 50% chance that you get petrified. And of course, petrification is especially horrible in this challenge because you have no way to heal it in battle. Auto Med obviously won't work against it because you're petrified so you can't use a soft on yourself. Auto Med won't heal anyone else in your party so even if you did somehow have enough remedies for it you couldn't use it. And well this just means that in this battle there is literally nothing you can do about petrification to completely remove the chance of it affecting you. So yeah Auto Potion kicked in for Waka which was pretty good and I decided to just keep going even though he got poisoned. Kimari was unfortunate. He had poison ward, but he still got hit with uh, the poison anyway. Again, a 50% chance if you have the ward. Then the second stone gaze came and Waka has no protection anyway. And so with 8,500 HP left, Kimari had it all to do. And unfortunately, he just wasn't strong enough to get the job done. So my first attempt failed. And as you can see, a little bit of it was just bad luck. I mean, I had the stone ward for Titus and I had the poison protection for Kimari, and they still got hit with the respective stasis anyway. So I just decided to just give it another go because I felt like I was a bit unlucky on that run. So I just went again, and I hoped, for example, let's say Stone Gaze could hit Waka instead because he produces the lowest damage output of the team. And so I was just waiting to see if I had a better RNG run. Second time round, he petrified Titus again with the first one, which was annoying, but I thought, let me just stick with it. Maybe you get lucky with the rest of the attacks. But I could tell pretty early on that this attempt wasn't going to go too great either. Was definitely curious to see how the poison ward would hold up this time for Kimari. Because I was pretty sure that it was 100%. Um, I did double check. And for both of those moves it is 100% chance of it being afflicted. Both the poison and the petrification. 
And so Kimari being poisoned twice in a row here, that's just, that's bad luck. I mean, there's a 25% chance of that happening over two battles. So the auto potion was kind of working okay for Wonka. You could see um, it was getting him out of trouble and it's out healing the poison damage that he's receiving. So it wasn't so bad, but it was basically an identical kind of situation to the first one. And with the same amount of HP left, pretty much we died again. So it was two game overs in a row, but I thought if I can get down to 8,500 with Tidus getting petrified immediately, then I'm pretty sure that I should be able to, to get this one done. So I decided to stick with it. And thanks to autosave, you can just go straight back into it and just rack up those attempts. And I was basically waiting for a good RNG run here where Tidus doesn't get petrified immediately to see if I could get it done. So attempt number three was underway and immediately I was looking to see who was going to get hit with this stone gaze this time around. Waka is the perfect candidate and so I thought, okay, this could be the run. Immediately so much more damage when Tidus is, is still kind of active and able to do damage. Then he landed an evading counter, which is another reason why Tidus not being petrified is huge. And as you can see, before you know it, Tidus basically all by himself is soloing this battle almost and just completely abusing Evray here. But there is still Poison Breath to come, so let's see what happens here. I mean, with that haste, you can see the CTB has changed as well. It's going to get two attacks in a row here. But it's not going to matter because Tidus lands a second critical and completely destroys Evray. So you can see how much the battle changed there between um, the first attempt and the next one. So Waka received another TKO here, just another stone touch weapon. Uh, nothing special, he has one already. And honestly, like, yeah, it would have been kind of cool if Kimari or Tidus got one, but it wasn't really the end of the world. And so I was I was more than happy to move on to the, the wedding crashing battles and see if I could get through those without issue as well. Of course, no saves here. You have to go straight back into it, but here, I knew that I had to deal with some fire element stuff, so I wanted to make sure that I had a little bit of protection. And so I set myself up for that. Also, the mechs here, they are weak to water and fire. So if you do have a bit of that, you can definitely make life easier for yourself as well. So I got my fire protection and I made sure I had some elemental stuff as well to help me out. And I was ready to move on and fight against the defenders of Yemen. I double checked the TKO here, um, it was a stone touch. I could add piercing to this as well to make it even better, but I decided not to use any of the level twos at this stage. I thought I might need them for the sphere grid and I wasn't sure how many more I'd be able to get. So piercing would have been ideal here, stone touch plus piercing, but I kept it simple. I decided to just use poison touch instead and to just give it like a double threat and I decided to move on once I got that prepared. Again, was pretty confident here because Tidus can one-hit KO these guys pretty easily. And then when I saw Waka could too, I was like, okay, yeah, this area should be a breeze. The YKT style enemy does have a thrust kick, but it's on the right side. So it's the first one that you take out. So that wasn't an issue either. Tidus lands another critical. You can see those one or two Lux Spheres that I use for him, they're starting to really come in handy here. He does have an enhanced rate of criticals due to the extra luck. So you are starting to see it manifest in the battle sometimes. I mean, two critical hits against Evre was a little bit lucky for sure, but it's not completely luck because he does have a notably higher luck stat than Kimari and Waka at this stage. The final thing I was curious about at this stage was what's gonna happen with the Yats, the, the ones that have the two cannons, basically. Uh, because they can be like further range, I was wondering what the characters were gonna do for that one. So that was the only one where I was like, maybe something weird could happen here. So I was curious to see how this particular battle played out. So we take this guy out, and then it was Waka's turn anyway, but then for the rest of the characters, it just says out of range. So when this happens, they skip their turn, which is pretty interesting. Because the game knows that Waka can hit, for that one, it's actually not a big deal. So that's how auto battle handles that particular situation. Tidus and Kimari will defend automatically, and Waka is the only one that can attack. And that becomes a little bit relevant uh, later on as well. So that was the final battle that we need to get through. And so without too much pain, we made it past Evray, we crashed the wedding, and we got to the final Cloister of Trials we need to deal with before the long gap all the way to the Zanakin Ruins. So with this one, of course, it's the, the mythical Destruction Sphere conundrum. 
again, I, I always say it and I'll continue to repeat it for as long as I'm around on YouTube. This particular chest that you open here, the first one, that is the Destruction Sphere prize. So this other chest that you see here, this is not needed to activate the statue in Barge. This one is just a, a complete optional extra that you can get as a result. This HP Sphere is the important one. That's a Destruction Sphere and you cannot miss it. You have to grab that in order to complete it. The second one here, this is completely optional, and I just got it anyway, just, just out of habit, but um, it's not gonna be something hugely useful here, but it's still, I just get it anyway. So you grab the Knight Lance here, and you can have a quick look at what that does, but it doesn't have piercing, which is the main reason why I choose to not use it. Piercing is just, as a general kind of, it's just a lot more useful than having like attack percentages. So that's why I decided to not use this one, because it was lacking. Um, the piercing. So that's all you need to know. You can make your way through the Cloister of Trials, grab a Harmut, and with that, it's on to one of the most interesting areas of the game. So yes, Yuna is all alone in the Via Purifico at the start, and she is not well equipped to handle this area by herself. So even if you have been working on her Sphere Grid, because of the nature of this challenge, she can only attack. Her only chance to really get through these battles is if she has an obscenely high strength stat, which she does not, of course, because I haven't used any like teleport spheres or anything like that for her. And the second option is statuses. Now, I did have one or two statuses at my disposal, and I was curious to see if they could get the job done. Uh, I gave her the Belladonna wand, which I had, and I had a stone proof as well. So I figured, let me just use this for now and just encounter something, just see what happens and see if I could get through. Because, of course, my main goal was going to be to try to get to Auron and Kimari as soon as possible. And once I had those guys, it would be pretty easy. But while Yuna's on her own, is she going to be able to make it to Kimari without dying? So that was like the main thing that I was curious about. And so once I tried to make a few preparations here, I decided to just set off and see what was going to happen. But I was not feeling very confident because she doesn't have a ton of HP. Um, I did level her up a little bit like during the run so far, but she's not like, if she had like, I don't know, 2,500, 3,000 HP, then I'd feel way more confident that she could hang in the battles. But at this stage, I pretty much knew that if I encountered anything, um, the likelihood of Yuna surviving it alone was close to zero. So I saved and I was getting ready for basically a situation where I would have to rely on RNG to not get an encounter by the time I made it to Kimari. So here's how my first attempt went to try and make it to Kimari. <laughs> I was just praying all the time that something wouldn't happen here, but... The encounter rate is low in the Via Purifico for sure, like notably lower, which is kind of the game. And I got so close here, but I got my first encounter. Now, three Sahakins, like Yuna taking out all of those guys with just attack alone. She does 15 damage. I mean, it's not going to happen. So you guys can see here, this is where like the challenge really just becomes basically impossible. And you'd have to do like an obscene amount of grinding. Um, before Yuna leaves the party to, to have any kind of chance of being able to survive here. So with the way that I was playing it, this was just not an option really. You weren't going to be able to get through like this. So I had to basically bite the bullet. And thankfully I was so close to Kimari on the, on the first attempt, I was thinking like, I'm pretty certain I will get a run where I can make it to Kimari. And I think even Kimari and Yuna together, they're already strong enough to, to get it done. So in that sense, I wasn't too worried um, that I'd be able to, to make it through here. So I quickly launched myself into attempt number two. This time around, I decided to try and customize a couple more things just to see if I could maybe kind of make them miss me when they attack. I thought that might be a better option here. But again, even if you do, let's say you get darkness to work on the Sahagins or sleep or something like that. It's like, unless you're willing to sacrifice this evade encounter, which by the way, is an option if that's what you want to do. Um, the damage that she does is so little that it would take you hours to win a battle. It's just, it's just not worth it. So I did briefly consider like the evade encounter. Um, if she had this entire section by herself and there was no help at all for the entirety of it, you would definitely be forced to customize evade encounter here. But thankfully it wasn't as big of a problem uh, for me. So attempt two also failed here, of course, because uh, there's just no way she's surviving these. There's just no way. I forgot auto battle here, but you guys get the point. I mean, it's, it's just... <laughs> 
poor Unimad, she's been absolutely harassed here. She did well to survive even this long in this battle. It was a, a valiant effort, but she's taking over a thousand damage from the two attacks. So, yeah, it wasn't going to happen. But I just had to keep trying here. I mean, this was the, the best strategy to survive here was definitely just to, to sprint towards Kimari and hope you don't get the encounter. That was pretty much the, the best way. So, that's what I kept on doing. And so, thankfully, third time was the charm. And I made it all the way to Kimari. And once he was in the party, I let out a big sigh of relief because my main man, my guardian Kimari, was there. And I knew that I was going to be safe. So, Kimari with his beefy 3000 HP, I knew that I had a much, much, much better chance of surviving here. And so, I got him on board. And I actually wanted to make sure I had the Confused Ward because I thought the Evil Eyes might cause me a problem. Now, thankfully, Confusion is only a 10% chance, so it's not that big a deal, but it's definitely worth it, because if Kimari gets confused, it's literally game over. So, once again, uh, Poison Touch from Yuna, and then Kimari's Piercing Weapon, uh, the two of them combined fairly well here. But that being said, it was still, like, dangerous. Uh, just the two of them, I think, was, uh, was definitely still on the risky end of things. But thankfully, I mean, as you can see, they're still getting it done. And Kimari, because he's moved on to Tyza's grid at this stage, he is getting a few little accuracy boosts, which helps him keep up with the lizards, for example. So he's not constantly missing those guys. Uh, if you moved him onto Auron's grid, let's say, from the start, then I think he would have missed these lizards a lot more, and you would have had a lot more problems. But keeping him on Tyza's grid or using him on Waka's grid definitely made sure he got more attack going as well. So once I grabbed Kimari, I decided to go back to the save sphere because I did want to have like a, a fresh save with Kimari on there as well. And then I wanted to move forward towards Auron so they could complete the party and get out of here. So yeah, there are definitely treasures here. You can hang around here and try to get every single treasure, uh, activate all the platforms and all that kind of stuff. But I don't think there's anything that's gonna be useful enough to me here. And I want to just push on and get to Isaru and beyond. So generally that was how Via Purifico went. It was extremely dangerous uh, and basically impossible for the unit that I had. But once I managed to make it to Kimari, then things became easier. And I managed to sprint over to Auron once I had those two together. And once it was Kimari, Auron, and Yuna, then it was pretty much a no-brainer. And we were able to get through. So thankfully, uh, even though it seemed almost impossible at the start, um, technically I guess you could have got through without even ever raising Yuna stats. You probably could have managed just fine. But the fact that we put a little bit of work into her and she was able to survive two or three attacks from these guys, it definitely made it more likely that we survived as a whole. Because obviously if you just leave Yuna at no sphere grid stats completely, then one attack takes her out. And that means the odds of Kimari getting mobbed by the remaining enemies is going to be much higher. So I think all in all it worked out pretty well. And the investment that I made into Yuna um, earlier on definitely paid off a little bit as well in the view of Purifico. So I wasn't too worried because I felt like the fact that we did level up Yuna a little bit makes her Aeons a bit stronger against Isaru as well. And we have been in a fair few battles as well, so their natural development would have been progressing along as well, because as a result of the challenge, you can't flee anything either. So all in all, again, I was feeling like, even though I could only use attack against Isaru's Aeons, I felt like I should be fine. So it didn't take too long, thankfully, before I was ready to move on to the Summoner versus Summoner battle at the end of the Viewer Proof Code. So I think to conclude part three of this challenge, we're going to end things with Isaru. And so we are facing off against his Aeons, of course. His Aeons, they don't scale at all according to your one, so they do have their fixed stats. And that means that if you do come into this with extremely underpowered Aeons as a result of Yuna basically being in no sphere grid kind of stats, then there is a chance that you could struggle. But I felt like even though it's attack only, I should be fine against Isaru and his Aeons. So let's see how the battle went. So the first summon from Isaru is, of course, Ifrit. I think he calls him Grothia, Grothia. And this was a, a good little test to see where my Aeons were at, because I hadn't summoned them since since Gui. And even then, I only summoned Valapor. So I was curious to see like how we'd stack up. I didn't really bother checking their stats much before this. I um, was just going to fling them out there and see how they do. In terms of who I was going to summon against Ifrit, I was, I was kind of torn, because I thought maybe it's going to do more damage than I expect. And so I want to reserve the Harmut for Isaru's Valifor, because Isaru's Valifor has a lot of HP and it can kind of catch you out. So I decided to not use Bahamut straight straight away against um, Ifrit. 
I end up choosing Ixion because a lot of people might not know, but Valifor and Shiva's attack damage is actually a little bit less than the other Aeons. So normally the, the attack power of the command attack is 16 for the likes of Ifrit, Ixion and Bahamut, but for Shiva and for Valifor their attack power is 14. And so even though they use the same attack, for the same strength stat they actually do less damage. And so they have less strength as standard anyway, and they have a weaker attack constant. So I decided to go for Ixion instead here to get a little bit more damage um, against Ifrit. And well, thankfully you can switch auto battle back on uh, once you have your Aeon out there. So it's kind of like a hybrid battle. It is still pretty much an auto battle kind of battle as well. You have to summon them manually, but then once you do, you can auto battle the rest of it, which is kind of cool. But yeah, quickly I was seeing that already um, it was able to, to kill the Ifrit pretty fast. And so I was feeling confident at this stage that it would be fine. Against Bahama, I figured even if it kills me, I've got multiple summons that I could use to defeat it. So it shouldn't be too bad. Like I said, this one actually has a lot of HP, so I decided to summon Bahama instead here. I thought this might be the better opportunity to to get it done. I think the others would have done fine as well. I think Ifrit and Ixion could have also killed it, but I just went for the strongest one that I had just to make sure that there were no mistakes here in this battle. And well, I hadn't summoned Bahama before anyway. It's a rare opportunity you're forced to summon in this game. So I thought we might as well see the big boy. So yeah, the first slap doing about 4,000 damage, I figured, yeah, this should be fine because if I remember correctly, it has 12,000 HP. So it's a decent chunk, but given how little damage it does and the fact that we can do 4,000, it was never going to last very long. And so, yeah, the final one to take on was Bahama himself. He just does the countdown and Mega Flare. And I think he has 15 or 20,000 HP, one of the two. Um, I'll put the annotation in there somewhere. But at this stage, I'd completely blasted through, so I was feeling pretty confident. And so I decided to summon Ifrit for this one to see if Ifrit could get the job done against Bahamut without needing any other support from the other Aeons. But yeah, in general, thankfully, the Via Purifica wasn't as horrible as I thought it might be. Uh, the fact that you could make it to Kimari without getting into any encounters, and the fact that the work I'd done on Yuna and the general amount of battles that I'd been in helped the Aeons be quite strong at this point. Uh, made the Via Purifico pretty nice and I just got to enjoy the beautiful Via Purifico theme for probably about half an hour, two minutes or something like that as I made my way through. Thankfully relatively painless. But in the back of my mind already I knew that there was a big Seymour battle coming up so I was already like getting anxious to see what was going to happen for that one. But as you can see here as we finish this Via Purifico section up, Ifrit made pretty light work of Bahamut and with that Isaru was dispatched and his pilgrimage ended there. So we pick things back up in the Via Purifico in the Titus section. Thankfully, there's this floating chest shop should you need anything uh, major here. Again, Yuna's not around, so maybe a high potion or something here and there could be useful for healing. But in general, I wanted to just make sure I was prepared here. Uh, Riku joins the fray once again, and she's just made like very little progress up until this point. So she's uh, a bit of a liability in that sense. But I'm hoping that Titus and Waka's overall strength should be enough to get things done here. So for Titus, I've got his uh, evading counter weapon once again. That's going to be featuring quite a lot over the next uh, few hours. And in terms of Waka, I decided to just keep the auto potion and to see what we could do with his uh, Stone Touch weapon and Poison Touch weapon as well. So for Riku, there isn't too much she can do attacking this. She can't really influence things very much. But her kind of staying alive and kind of absorbing some attacks here and there is probably, probably about the most useful she can be at this particular stage in the game. So I start to swim towards Evre Altana and the first encounter, already you can kind of start to get a feel for how things are going to play out here. Riku, um, she has a decent amount of HP again, it's kind of similar to Yuna. I didn't completely abandon her and kind of just leave her with no sphere grid stats. So she can absorb like a couple of hits from most enemies, which is definitely helpful. But she's nowhere near the level of Titus and Waka at the moment. And so second encounter was something more dangerous here, but Titus again can one hit KO here, which is definitely useful. 
And Riku, again, you're seeing there, she's managing to survive some attacks as well. So overall, so far as well, with the help of the TKO and Titus' massive strength as well. So far, so good. Definitely wanted to make sure I saved before every Altana because I wasn't quite sure what I was going to be encountering. Um, it's got like the, the Shining type move, the, the Photon Spray, I think it's called. Um, it's also, again, it's got Stone Gaze. So there's some definitely dangerous things here, so I wanted to make sure I was kind of ready for it. And luckily enough, for Riku, we did have a Shell Targe, which was kind of like interesting because if she falls into critical HP during Photon Spray, she'll at least take less damage, which is, uh, which is also a nice little benefit. So I decided to try and give myself some Petrification Protection. And, uh, and with Waka, I had a Slow Touch weapon that I got from the Sandworm. And I decided to just see if I could take down every Altana with this particular challenge and restriction. So once again, Tyler's coming in with massive damage, and he's doing so much damage, in fact, that basically like three or four attacks from Tyler's plus whatever Waka's doing would already be enough to get the job done. But immediately Tyler's got Stone Gaze, but thankfully Stonewall kicked in and he survived it, and he replied nicely with another 4,000 there. So I was already feeling fairly confident about this one. Um, it is doing a lot of damage. It's counter-attacking, basically, um, as you can see. And so that is a problem. But I felt like I had enough to, to get this one done, even if it was going to be pretty close here. So Photon Spray came in. Thankfully, it's a low damage move and something that both of the guys could survive here. And then before long, I was able to take them out. Clutch dodge there from Tidus. He would have saved it anyway. But um, as you can see, generally, the strength that we had was enough to pull through. Now, if it had Evray's HP, then it would have been a lot more dangerous, um, I think, because you wouldn't have just been able to blast through. I would have had to have been stronger or be a bit luckier with certain dodges or who it decided to stone gaze and that kind of thing. But the way it played out with the lower HP that it has, it was definitely not too bad. Now, annoyingly, I got, I got a TKO again. Uh, that's the third TKO that Waka's got in this game, which is kind of funny. Now, Waka here, another reason I didn't use a Teleport Sphere on him is because he grabs a rematch in this particular area. Definitely do not forget to pick that up if you are doing a challenge like this um, in this game. To be honest, most challenge runs, or even any run, Evade Encounter is so useful that you want to be picking that up whenever you can. So that's the reason also that I didn't customize anything for Waka with Evade Encounter on there, because I knew he was going to get one for free from this particular section as well. So, picked up Evade Encounter, beat Evray Altana, and I was ready to move on to the High Bridge, which would be a very, very important area for this run. So, I think that's where we're going to wrap it up for this particular episode. It might be a little bit longer than part two, but that's fine. I think this is a good position to end it. We will be returning in the next one with the High Bridge, which ended up being a very important area and then see more Natus. So there's a lot of really cool stuff to come in the next episode as well. Some serious bosses that we all know and hate, and you will see how that's going to go very soon, hopefully. Thank you, as always, for the support so far. I hope you're continuing to enjoy the series. There is definitely going to be more episodes coming. Like I say, I, I don't want to spoil how far I've got at this stage, but I think you guys are going to enjoy uh, what's in store. So thank you for all the support. As always, early access is available on Patreon alongside many other perks. Definitely recommend anyone who is able to to support the series and the channel through there. It makes a massive difference and impact to my ability to create such content. So thank you all once again. I will see you for the next episode of this challenge. Thank you for watching. Take care.